Welcome to Hollywood Graveyard, where we set out to remember and celebrate the lives of those who lived to entertain us, by visiting their final resting places. Today we're exploring cemeteries around Paris, France, where we'll find such stars as Edith Piaf, Oscar Wilde, Jim Morrison, Chopin, and many more. Join us, won't you? Paris is for lovers, or so the saying goes. Lovers of what is subjective, I suppose. For you and me, the proud taphophile, we love cemeteries and famous graves. We stroll the dark avenues of the dead, while others stroll Champs-Élysées. <laughs> Welcome to Paris, my friends. After a wonderfully scenic couple of days in Switzerland, we boarded a train for France and its storied capital city to continue our hunt for the famous and the dead across parts of Europe. The shadows of many greats loom large over the city of Paris, from artists and entertainers to scientists, innovators, and political figures. We won't have time to visit all the major cemeteries and famous graves around Paris, but we'll hit as many key highlights as we can, can. So without further ado, let's hop the nearest train and start exploring Paris. Our tour of Paris begins today at one of the most famous cemeteries, not just in France, but in the world. The infamous Père Lachaise Cemetery. So prominent is this cemetery, it has its own metro stop. After the closure of cemeteries in central Paris in the 1700s, large cemeteries were established on the outskirts of the city to handle the city's burial needs. Père Lachaise was established by Napoleon in 1804 as a non-denominational cemetery, open to anyone, regardless of race or religion. This beautiful cemetery has become a popular tourist destination and has been the backdrop of numerous film and television productions. Since starting Hollywood Graveyard years ago, Père Lachaise has been high on my list of cemeteries to visit. It did not disappoint. Our first stop here is in Division 21, just south of Capelle de l'Est. Here we find a man who spoke volumes without saying a word, the quintessential Parisian mime. Marcel Marceau. Mime, as the art form we know today, was developed in France in the 19th century. Marcel Marceau would take up the mantle of the French mime artist in the 1940s, creating his character Bip the Clown, instantly recognizable with his face paint, black and white striped shirt, and top hat. As a practitioner of pantomime, he was without peer, growing to worldwide fame for the craft he called the art of silence. He used his talents to aid the French resistance during World War II. Performing silently as Bip, the mime kept groups of Jewish children quiet for hours as they escaped across the border from occupied France into Switzerland. Marceau was also close friends with Michael Jackson, his walking against the wind routine, one of the inspirations for Jackson's moonwalk. And in a hilarious twist of irony, Marceau had the only spoken line in Mel Brooks's silent movie. No! In 1978, he founded the International School of Mime Drama in Paris and later established the Marceau Foundation to promote mime in the United States. The world-famous mime went silent for the last time at the age of 84. Just across the street west is one of the most unique tombstones here at Père Lachaise. Reclining in bronze atop the tombstone is an effigy of the man who rests therein, Theodore Jericho. With palette and paintbrush in hand, you probably deduce that Jericho was a painter one of the pioneers of the Romantic movement of the 1800s. His tomb features a replica of his most famous painting, The Raft of Medusa, completed in 1819. It became an icon of French Romanticism. Jericho was just 32 when he died from various illnesses. Heading due south, we find the poet of the piano, one of the great composers of the Romantic era, Frédéric Chopin. He was known principally for writing for solo piano, and was unequaled in his day. He was a musical child prodigy, born in Poland and later settling in Paris. His innovations of harmony and melody would come to define the Romantic era, and has influenced Western music to this day. He performed all across Europe in the early 1800s, a bona fide music star. Among his best known works are his Nocturne Opus 9 No. 2, Fantasy Impromptu, The Minute Waltz, and 
perhaps the most apropos piece of his to reference while standing here at his grave is his iconic funeral march. You know the one. Chopin suffered from ill health much of his life, partially the result of having contracted tuberculosis. He died at just 39, this death mask taken shortly thereafter. Chopin's own funeral march was played at the procession here at Père Lachaise. His tombstone features the muse of music weeping over a broken lyre. You'll be curious to know that not all of Chopin rests here. He left his heart in Poland, literally. It was removed after his death and buried at Holy Cross Church in Warsaw, in accordance with his wishes. Just a few spaces away is another famous pianist, Michel Petrucciani one of the great jazz pianists of the 20th century. He was born with osteogenesis imperfecta, growing to just three feet tall and living much of his life in pain. This didn't stop him from becoming an accomplished pianist. In fact, he said it saved him from being ordinary. He gave his first professional concert at just 13, and soon found himself traveling the world, performing with some of the great jazz musicians in the world, in some of the greatest venues, like Carnegie Hall. He would also release dozens of albums in his career. Michel Petrucciani was just 36 when he died from pneumonia. Let's continue south to find another legendary musician. We featured him in our viewers special, but no stop here at Père Lachaise would be complete without a visit to Jim Morrison, legendary singer and frontman of the rock band The Doors. The band formed in Venice, California in 1965, and would soon embody the rebellious counterculture of youth in that era. They shot to fame with their song, Light My Fire. Come on, baby, light my fire. Other hits include Break On Through to the Other Side, Riders on the Storm, Riders on the Storm. and my favorite Doors song, People Are Strange. People are strange. When you're a stranger, faces look ugly when you're alone. With his wild and unpredictable personality, unique voice, and poetic lyrics, Morrison would become one of the most influential frontmen in the history of rock. In 1971, Morrison was living in Paris with his girlfriend Pamela. On the morning of July 3rd, he was found dead in the bathtub. His cause of death has been shrouded in mystery since no autopsy was performed, the official cause being listed as heart failure. Jim Morrison was just 27. Due to the over-enthusiasm of fans, who have a tendency to vandalize and leave piles of offerings, or steal things, like the bust of Jim that used to be here, this section where Jim Morrison rests is now partitioned off with fencing. The current marker features a Greek quote meaning something in the vein of true to his own spirit. Let's turn our compass east now to Division 96. Here rests Amadeo Modigliani. He was a painter and sculptor, active here in Paris in the early 1900s. He's known for his unique, modern, and surreal style of painting and sculpting, particularly portraits with elongated and exaggerated features. His style wasn't particularly well received when he was alive, and he found very little success. Only after his death did he find the renown that eluded him in life. Such is the lot of many an artist, it seems. He died from tuberculosis at just 35. Just across the street east is Division 97. Here we find a woman who became the very voice of Paris, the little sparrow, Edith Piaf. Her singing style seemed to reflect the struggles of her upbringing. She was born to a street performer father and circus performer mother. Edith was abandoned at birth and raised by her grandmother in a brothel. By her teens, she reunited with her father and began singing on the streets to earn a living. On the streets where she sometimes slept. Soon though, Edith would find herself singing in nightclubs and cabarets, and becoming much in demand from cabarets to large music halls across the world. She specialized in chanson and torch ballads, her songs often reflecting love, loss, and sorrow. But it was her cheerily optimistic song about seeing life through rose-colored glasses that made her an international star. La Vie en Rose, for which Edith wrote the lyrics, became her signature song in the 1940s. Oh, 
Another of her popular hits, Non Je Ne Regrette Rien, was introduced to a new audience as a key plot device in the movie Inception. Alcohol abuse and a series of car accidents left her in poor health by her 40s. She died from an aneurysm due to liver failure at just 47. It's said that 100,000 mourners lined the streets of Paris for her funeral procession, the first time the traffic in Paris came to a complete standstill since the war. A biopic was made about the life of Edith Piaf in 2007, titled La Vie en Rose. Moving up to Division 44 now, we find the grave of Sarah Bernhardt. The Divine Sarah, as she was known, was the most popular stage actress in France in the 19th century, starring in some of the great plays of the era, including La Dame aux Camélias by Alexandre Dumas and Rui Blas by Victor Hugo. Her popularity led to a number of international tours, including in the US. As one of the biggest stars of her era, Sarah would become a popular muse for the era's notable painters and glamour photographers. She would also be among the very first prominent stage performers to make sound recordings and to act in motion pictures. Her first film appearance was a scene from Hamlet in 1900. Sarah initially detested the medium of cinema, but with the success of films like Camille in 1912, quickly found her way in the movies, starring in a handful of silent films. Throughout her life, Sarah Bernhardt had a keen preoccupation with death. She kept a satin-lined coffin in her bedroom, often sleeping or studying her roles in it. She also preferred the roles of characters who died in the end. In 1923, Sarah was filming the movie The Clairvoyant. Due to her failing health, she was too weak to travel, so a room in her house was set up as a film studio, complete with lights, scenery, and cameras. She died in March before the completion of the film. Sarah Bernhardt was 78. There's only one thing in life worse than being talked about, and that's not being talked about. That said, let's talk about the man who wrote those words, Oscar Wilde. The renowned author, poet, playwright, and master of wit was born in Dublin, Ireland in 1854, and went on to study in England. His literary talent was recognized early as he began to publish his works of poetry and plays. His work, combined with his flamboyant lifestyle, made him a bona fide celebrity of the late Victorian era, his work often holding up a critical mirror to the hypocrisies of Victorian society. Among his best-known works are plays like Salome and The Importance of Being Earnest, short stories like The Canterville Ghost, and the only novel he wrote, The Picture of Dorian Gray. All have been adapted on stage or screen many times over the years. At the height of his career in 1895, in what would be one of the first widely publicized celebrity trials, Oscar Wilde was convicted of gross indecency for consensual homosexual acts. Homosexuality was illegal at that time. He was imprisoned for two years, and his career imploded. After his release, he fled to France and wrote his last work, The Ballad of Reading Jail, about his time in prison. His last years were spent impoverished and in exile. He died from meningitis in 1900, at just 46. His tomb has often been the unwitting canvas for Sharpies and lipstick, devoted fans wanting to show their love but were actually damaging the tomb. Someone even did away with the angel's <clears throat> manhood. So to prevent further vandalism and constant cleanup, the tomb of Oscar Wilde is now surrounded by plexiglass. Strolling through Père Lachaise feels like a walk through a 19th century neighborhood, along cobblestone streets lined with tiny houses, which just happen to be occupied by the dead. Northwest, just across the street from the crematorium, we find the grave of Michel Legrand, whose brand new tombstone was being engraved the very day we visited. He was a composer, known particularly for his film and television scores. He was nominated for an Academy Award 13 times in his career, winning three, for Yentl, Summer of 42, and the song The Windmills of Your Mind from The Thomas Crown Affair. Like the circles that you find in the windmills of your mind. He was a key figure in French New Wave cinema, scoring films for directors like Jean-Luc Godard and Jacques Demy, including The Umbrellas of Cherbourg, he also wrote and performed jazz music, touring the world playing concerts with numerous jazz greats. 
He died from septicemia at the age of 86. Let's head over now to the crematorium and columbarium. On the west side of the columbarium, up to the second level, we find the mother of modern dance, Isadora Duncan. She was born in California, but by her early 20s was living in Europe, where she taught and performed dance to great acclaim. Her style was inspired by more naturalistic and improvised movement, veering from the rigidity of traditional ballet. She strove to connect emotions with movement. It was a novel approach to dance then, not to everyone's taste, but today recognized as an early spark of the modern dance movement. Her schools of dance operated at one time or another in Berlin, Paris, New York, and Moscow. Her life was cut short suddenly while riding as a passenger in a convertible automobile in 1927. She was wearing a long flowing scarf around her neck at the time. The scarf caught in the rear wheel, pulling her from the car and breaking her neck. Isadora Duncan was 50. Continuing around clockwise, we reach the niche of composer Paul Dukas. Perhaps not a name as well known as Debussy or Beethoven, still, Paul Dukas composed one of the best known orchestral concert pieces in history. In 1897, he wrote The Sorcerer's Apprentice, inspired by Goethe's poem of the same name. The theme of the playfully scherzo piece is instantly recognizable, and many audiences know it today as the musical backdrop of Disney's Fantasia. Paul Dukas had several other popular works in his day, but all eclipsed by The Sorcerer's Apprentice. He died at the age of 69. On the southeast side, down on the main level, is Max Ernst. He was a painter, sculptor, and graphic artist who, despite having no formal art training, was one of the pioneers of the Dada and Surrealist movements in the early 20th century. He was very experimental in his approach to art, developing techniques such as frottage, a form of pencil rubbing, and grattage, scratching fresh paint with a sharp blade, as well as the use of collage. His surreal works were often inspired by dream and fantasy, as well as spiritualism. He also appeared in a small handful of films, including 1930's The Golden Age. Ernst lived to be 84. To find our next star, we must enter the lower level of the columbarium. Here rests Emil Cole. He was an early pioneer of animation, sometimes called the father of animated cartoons. Fascinated by the 1907 film, The Haunted Hotel, which combines live action with stop motion animation, Cole studied the film frame by frame to learn the art of animation. In 1908, Cole made Phantasmagory, considered the very first fully animated cartoon becoming the first filmmaker to then fully dedicate himself to animated cartoons. He would go on to create over 200 animated films into the 1920s, but soon bigger names would steal the spotlight, like Windsor McKay and Walt Disney. He fell into obscurity and was financially ruined by the Great Depression by 1930. Emil Cole died from pneumonia at age 81. Back out to the grounds, we're in Division 49, here lies Michel Delpec. He was a singer and songwriter who rose to popularity in France in the 60s and 70s. He had hits in the song White is White, a tribute to the Isle of Wight Rock Festival, and Pour une Flirt. Pour un flirt avec toi. A longtime smoker, Delpec was diagnosed with throat cancer in 2013. He died three years later at the age of 69. Just a few spaces away is 60s cinema and style icon Anna Karina. She's remembered for her prominent role in French New Wave cinema in the 60s, being the muse of director Jean-Luc Godard. She would appear in eight of his films, including Pierrot Le Fou, Alphaville, and A Woman is a Woman, which earned her critical acclaim. Je suis toi cruelle, mais enrage, parce que je suis... The 1967 TV musical comedy Anna was written for her, and she had a hit song from that production, Sous le Soleil Exactement. Sous le soleil exactement. 
In the 70s, Anna formed a production company to produce and direct her own film, Vivre Ensemble. She continued to perform, sing, and write into the 2000s, passing away in 2019 at age 79. Continuing west to Division 48, we find the grave of Honoré de Balzac. He was a French novelist and playwright, one of the founders of realism in European literature. His magnum opus is the series of novels known collectively as La Comédie Humaine, the human comedy, which paints an epic picture of French life in the early 19th century, spanning nearly a hundred novels and novellas. He continued to write at a furious pace until dying from heart failure at age 51. Still further west, nearly hidden between two large tombs, we find George Bizet. He was one of the great composers of the Romantic era. He's known particularly for his operas. His last work, Carmen, one of the most well-known and frequently performed operas in the world. It features those instantly recognized arias Habanera, and Toreador song. The opera was first performed in Paris in 1875, and with its flouting of conventions of the time, shocked and scandalized audiences. Reactions were mixed, and Bizet was convinced he had a flop. Bizet suffered ill health much of his adult life, and died just months after the premiere of Carmen, never knowing the global phenomenon that it would become and remain over a century later. Other of his works that remain popular to this day are the incidental music written for the play L'Arlesienne. George Bizet was just 36 when he died. Over now to section 56 is another famous George, George Seurat. He was a painter known as an innovator of the pointillism style, in which small dots are used to form a painting rather than long brush strokes. His best known work is A Sunday Afternoon on the Island of La Grande Jatte which depicts a casual afternoon on the banks of the Seine River in 1880s Paris. It was a founding work of the Neo-Impressionist movement. So popular was this painting it became the basis of a Broadway musical by Stephen Sondheim. Like so many of the gifted artists we've met today, Georges Seurat met an early death. He was just 31. His cause of death remains uncertain, sometimes attributed to pneumonia, meningitis, or diphtheria. Our last stop here in Père Lachaise brings us to the northernmost section, where we find our third famous Georges in a row, the creator of the cinematic spectacle, Georges Méliès. His grave was partially hidden under a tarp, likely for cleaning or renovations. Georges Méliès is considered by many as the father of motion picture special effects. He began his career on stage performing magic. The skills he learned as an illusionist would translate to his innovative efforts in creating special effects on film. He began experimenting with film in the late 1800s, developing photographic tricks and effects like double exposure, time-lapse, dissolves, and substitution splices. This allowed audiences to experience things that were not possible in the real world, even in stage illusion, and took the budding medium of the movies to a whole new level. He created hundreds of short films, most notable among them are The Impossible Voyage in 1904, and A Trip to the Moon in 1902, which features one of the most iconic scenes in cinema history. By the 20s, Melies' career had declined, and he had become all but forgotten. Most of his prints tragically melted down for silver. He made ends meet working a small candy and toy stand in Paris. The rediscovery of his work by the 30s led to him being presented the Legion of Honor, and assured his place in the annals of cinema history. He died from cancer at the age of 76, just hours after the passing of another French film pioneer, who we visited earlier, Emile Cole. George is buried here alongside his wife, Jean Dalcy, real name Charlotte, who appeared in close to 20 of her husband's films, including A Trip to the Moon. Also notably, she played Joan of Arc's mother in 1900, 
the fairy godmother in 1899's Cinderella, and she's credited with appearing in the earliest surviving nude scene on film, in 1897's After the Ball, The Bath, though the nudity was implied as she was wearing a skin-colored partial bodysuit. Jean died in 1956 at the age of 91. Leaving Père Lachaise behind, we cross the River Seine into the city, and head to the 18th century marvel of architecture and art, one of Paris's most visited landmarks, the Pantheon. It was built between 1758 and 1790 at the behest of King Louis XV. It was originally intended to be a church dedicated to Saint Genevieve, but after the onset of the French Revolution, it was decided that it would be transformed into a mausoleum for the remains of distinguished French citizens modeled after the Pantheon in Rome. In these historic halls are monuments to both the religious and secular history of France. Part of that secular history includes the demonstration of the rotation of the Earth. In 1851, physicist Leon Foucault constructed a 220-foot pendulum peer beneath the central dome. The original pendulum is in a museum, with this replica here in its place. Beneath the Pantheon is a crypt where many of France's notable figures have been entombed. Those who rest here are deemed national heroes by Parliament. Let's see who we can find here. Just in from the entrance on the left is Voltaire. Born Francois-Marie Arouet in 1694, Voltaire, as he would become known, was a French Enlightenment writer and philosopher. His works cover nearly every medium of writing, including poems, plays, novels, essays, histories, etc. He was an early advocate for the ideals that, though more commonly accepted today, were quite progressive in his day, like basic civil liberties, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and separation of church and state. Many of these ideals would spark the French Revolution decades later. Among his best-known writings are the fictitious Lettres Philosophiques and the satirical novel Candide. Yet amidst all of his writings, perhaps his greatest legacy was teaching his readers to think clearly. Voltaire enlarged the human spirit and taught it to be free. He died in 1778 at the age of 83. Because of his criticism of the church, he was denied a Christian burial in Paris. He was initially buried in Champagne until 1791 when his remains were enshrined here in the Pantheon. Let's move deeper into the crypt. Inscriptions on the outer walls tell us who lies within. Fortunately for us, the individual crypts were open for visitation when we were there. This is where Marie Curie is laid to rest. She was born in Poland and came to Paris to study in her 20s, her focuses of study being physics and chemistry. Marie Curie is remembered for her pioneering research on radioactivity, a term she coined. She worked with her husband Pierre Curie, and together their research into radioactivity earned them the Nobel Prize in 1903 making Marie Curie the first woman to be awarded the honor. Eight years later, in 1911, she won a second Nobel Prize, this one in chemistry, for her discovery of the elements polonium and radium, using techniques she invented for isolating radioactive isotopes. This would make her the first person to win two Nobel Prizes. Under her direction, the first studies into the treatment of cancer with radiation were conducted, and during World War I, she helped the military develop mobile x-ray units for field hospitals. In the years since, Marie Curie has become one of the most iconic scientists in history and an inspiration to women everywhere. Marie Curie died in 1934 at the age of 66 from aplastic anemia. The damaging effects of radiation were not well understood at the time of her work, and absent protective measures likely affected her health. She was originally buried with Pierre in a cemetery in the Paris suburbs, but 60 years later, capping off the many firsts by Marie Curie, she would become the first woman to be enshrined here in the Pantheon when she and her husband were moved here in 1995. Marie is here with her husband Pierre Curie, French physicist and pioneer in various fields of science, including radioactivity. Before his innovative research in radioactivity with Marie, he and his brother discovered piezoelectricity through crystal oscillators, which today are used in many of the consumer devices we use every day, like that cell phone you're watching this video on. Pierre and Marie married in 1895 and began their revolutionary work together, for which they shared the Nobel Prize, the scientific unit of radiation now being called a Curie. 
but Pierre's life and work were cut tragically short when crossing the street in the rain in 1906. He slipped and fell under a heavy horse-drawn cart. He died instantly at the age of 46. Over to the other end of the crypt, we find a room full of legendary French writers. First on the right is Emile Zola. He was one of the most prominent authors of late 19th century France. He was known as a practitioner of naturalism in literature, in contrast to the romanticism in the first half of the 19th century. His best known work in this field is the 20 novel series known collectively as Les Rougon Marcart, which follows the lives of fictional families during the Second French Empire. Zola is also remembered for his role in the Dreyfus Affair, through his famous open letter, opening with J'accuse. Emile Zola died suddenly from carbon monoxide poisoning caused by a block chimney flu. He was 62. At his funeral he was eulogized as not only a great novelist, but a defender of truth and a champion of the persecuted. In 1937 he was portrayed by Paul Mooney in the biopic The Life of Emile Zola. At the end of the room is Alexandre Dumas, one of the most widely read French authors known for his historical adventure stories. His best known works are The Count of Monte Cristo and The Three Musketeers, both written as serials in the 1840s. Countless film and stage adaptations have been made of the works of Dumas, keeping his stories alive for every new generation. Before his success as a novelist, Dumas was actually a noted playwright. His play Henry III and His Court considered one of the first great romantic dramas produced on the Paris stage. Alexandre Dumas lived to be 68, and was originally buried in the Cimetière de Villers-Cotret. On the 200th anniversary of his birth, his remains were exhumed and relocated here to the Pantheon. Circling back, we find Victor Hugo, another of the greatest and best-known French writers and poets. Two stories that are inexorably connected with Paris and France came from the mind of Hugo, Les Miserables and The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Les Miserables, considered one of the greatest novels ever written, is the story of ex-convict Jean Valjean who becomes a force for good while unable to escape his criminal past. It touches on the social ills being fought then, and still being fought by many today. Perhaps the most notable adaptation of Les Miserables is the musical, which debuted in Paris in 1980. The 1985 English version is now the longest running West End musical and has also been adapted on film. Hugo's The Hunchback of Notre Dame has also been adapted on film numerous times, from a silent version starring Lon Chaney to the Disney version in 1996. The Gothic novel made Notre Dame de Paris a national icon, which is currently rising from the ashes of a devastating fire in 2019. Victor Hugo was also a major political influence in democratic France, espousing ideas of universal suffrage, free education for children, and the abolition of slavery and the death penalty. Hugo went into exile after Napoleon III overthrew France's democratic system of government, but returned a hero after the fall of the Second Empire in 1870 and the re-establishment of the Republic. In 1885, Victor Hugo died from pneumonia at age 83, sparking a period of national mourning. Millions joined the funeral procession from the Arc de Triomphe to the Pantheon. In the next room down, we find a man who gave new life and hope to the seeing impaired, Louis Braille. At the age of three, young Louis was playing with some of his father's tools and accidentally stabbed himself in the eye with an awl. An infection from the injury spread, and eventually he lost both eyes. His blindness didn't stop him from excelling in his studies. But Louis was frustrated by the systems used in his day for the blind to read and write and he grew determined to devise his own system that could bridge the communication gap between the blind and the seeing. He came across a tactile system of raised dots developed by Charles Barbier. Impressed by the system, he worked to improve upon it and optimize it. His system was largely completed by 1824 when he was just 15. Small revisions over the years led to the system we know today as Braille, named for its creator, which consists of six raised dots in two columns. But Braille's system wouldn't be adapted in his lifetime, so he went to his grave not knowing the profound effect he would have on generations of the blind. Braille was just 43 when he died from tuberculosis. He was originally buried in his hometown of Couvray, 
but on the 100th anniversary of his death his remains were moved here to the Pantheon. However, in a symbolic gesture, his hands were removed and left buried in his hometown. No self-respecting tombstone tourist could take a trip to Paris and not visit the world-famous catacombs of Paris. Truly one of the most unique experiences you can have while grave hunting. Getting up close and personal with the dead. Down, down, down we go, deep under the city of Paris. Down endless stairways and along endless corridors carved into the rock. Corridors barely taller than you are, the air cooling with every step reaching 90 feet below the surface. Halt! This is Death's Empire, aka my home turf. Fair warning, the catacombs are not for the faint of heart. The catacombs of Paris are an ossuary that hold the remains of some six million individuals. By the late 1700s, cemeteries in the city of Paris began to overflow, causing health and safety concerns. The solution was to move the bones from all of central Paris's cemeteries to an abandoned underground quarry dating back to the 15th century. Little by little these former limestone quarries began to fill up with the bones from all the cemeteries of central Paris. Initially the bones were stacked haphazardly, but in 1810 the inspector general of the quarries decided to develop the area for a museum-like atmosphere and stack the bones in geometric and neat patterns, creating bone walls and formations called hags. The catacombs were then open to the public, and have been a popular destination for the curious thrill-seeker ever since. Back up to the Empire of the Living, our next stop is a complex of museums and monuments known as Les Invalides. It's dedicated particularly to the military history of France. Beneath the Grand Dome, one just lofty enough for the hubris of the man resting thereunder, we find the tomb of Napoleon Bonaparte. He was one of the great military leaders during the French Revolution, and by the age of 26 was commanding the French army in battles all across Europe and Egypt. Upon returning to Paris in 1799, he seized power through a coup d'etat, and crowned himself emperor in 1804. He would reign as emperor over much of Europe for the next 10 years, then briefly again in 1815, before his empire fell and he abdicated the throne. His legacy is a mixed one, He's recognized as one of the great commanders in history, and he did much good in rebuilding France after the wars, instituting higher education, championing the arts and science, founding the first central bank in France, and establishing a fair and modern legal system that espoused equality before the law. But he was also a despot, whose megalomaniacal warmongering led to the deaths of millions of Europeans. He forced his way into power, and used propaganda and strict censorship to legitimize his regime. After a crushing defeat at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, the British exiled him to the remote island of St. Helena, where he died in 1821 at the age of 51. He was originally buried on St. Helena, but before his death, Napoleon had expressed a desire to be buried on the banks of the Seine in Paris. In 1840, King Louis Philip I obtained permission from the British government to return Napoleon's body to Paris. He was exhumed, his casket opened to ensure it still contained the former emperor. He was finally entombed in this red quartzite sarcophagus in 1861. In 2021, on the bicentenary of his death, a replica of the skeleton of his favorite horse, Marengo, was hung from the cupola above, and floats like a phantom over his tomb. To reach our next Paris cemetery, we pass by the Eiffel Tower and cross back over the Seine, in the direction of the Trocadero. This is Cimetière de Passy. It's the only cemetery in the world with a view of the Eiffel Tower nearby. Here we find the grave of Edouard Manet. He was another of Paris's renowned painters, a pivotal figure in the transition from realism to impressionism in the 19th century. He was a bridge between the rigidity of traditional art and something that was fundamentally new, unencumbered by rules. That something would become modern art. 
His paintings, like Luncheon on the Grass and Olympia, sparked both notoriety and controversy among the public when first exhibited, while others depicted the simple beauties of real 19th century life. In the 1880s, Manet began to suffer from serious medical conditions. In 1883, his left foot was amputated because of gangrene, due to complications from syphilis and rheumatism. He died a short time later, at the age of 51. Just south, not far from Manet, we find the grave of serial queen Pearl White. She was an actress of the silent film era, starring in over 200 films. She became an international star as the lead heroine in the Perils of Pauline series and other serials of the era. At one time, her popularity even rivaled that of Mary Pickford. She became well known for performing most of her own dangerous stunts. Pearl retired from the screen in 1924 and settled in Paris. Heavy drinking, sometimes to dull the pain of injuries she sustained while filming, led to liver failure later in life. She died at just 49. Pearl was portrayed by Betty Hutton in the 1947 biopic, The Perils of Pauline. Let's head northwest to section two. Here lies Hubert de Givenchy. You fashion buffs will recognize that name. The house of Givenchy, sometimes just Givenchy, is a luxury fashion and perfume house formed by Hubert in 1952. He's famous for having designed wardrobe and clothing for legends including Audrey Hepburn in Breakfast at Tiffany's and Jackie Kennedy. He designed costumes for other films as well, including Sabrina, Paris When It Sizzles, and Funny Face, which earned him an Oscar nomination. These were all for the woman considered his muse, Audrey Hepburn. Hubert de Givenchy died in his sleep in 2018 at the age of 91. In the western end of the cemetery, we squeeze through a narrow alley to find another of France's storied composers, Claude Debussy. He was a founder of the Impressionist movement in music, his innovative style breaking with the norms of tonality of western music to that point. He was greatly inspired by the Symbolist movement, and also took inspiration from natural sources like clouds, the moon, and the sea, to paint unique sonic landscapes. Perhaps his most famous work is his piece for solo piano, Claire de Lune, which you're listening to right now. It was first published in 1905. He was also known for orchestral work like Prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn, his opera, Peleus and Melisande. Debussy died from cancer in 1918 at the age of 55. World War I was raging at the time, and Paris was under aerial bombardment by the Germans, so there was no public funeral or ceremony for Debussy. A small funeral procession made its way through the city as German guns rained hellfire from the skies. He was temporarily buried at Père Lachaise before finally being laid to rest here, among the trees and the birds, with his wife, and daughter. Our last Paris cemetery is a few miles north of here. This is Cemetière Le Valois Perret. We've honored many of the 20th century's great composers today in Paris, and there's one more to find. Here lies Maurice Ravel. Like Debussy, he was associated with Impressionism of the late 19th century. One of his best known, frequently performed works is Bolero an orchestral piece originally commissioned as a ballet by Russian actress and dancer Ida Rubinstein. And another timeless masterpiece penned by Ravel is the grand ballet Daphnis and Chloe. He also orchestrated Mussorgsky's pictures at an exhibition. Ravel was among the first of the orchestral composers to recognize the potential of the new medium of recording to bring his music to a wider audience. His final years saw a gradual cognitive decline, though the exact nature of his illness remains unsure. Maurice Ravel died in 1937 at age 62. And finally, we end our Paris tour with the man whose creation has become the landmark symbol of Paris. Here lies Gustave Eiffel. 
or Eiffel as we say in English. He was a civil engineer in 1800s Paris who made a name for himself building bridges for the railway network. In 1889 the World's Fair was being held in Paris. A grand centerpiece was envisioned to celebrate the centennial of the French Revolution. Engineers at Eiffel's company offered the initial designs and construction began in 1887. Upon its completion two years later the Eiffel Tower was the tallest man-made structure in the world. Initial reactions to the tower were mixed, many seeing it as an eyesore or even going so far as to protest its construction. It was only intended to stand for 20 years then be dismantled, but in addition to practical uses for the tower, its status as one of the most visited and recognized landmarks in the world will keep it standing forever. Not only did Eiffel build France's most iconic landmark, he contributed to America's too, designing the internal structure of the Statue of Liberty, which was built at Eiffel's workshop before being dismantled and reassembled in New York. Gustave Eiffel lived to be 91, passing away in Paris in 1923. And that concludes our tour. What are some of your favorite memories of the stars we visited today? Share them in the comments below, and be sure to like, share, and subscribe for more famous grave tours. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one. This was a curious discovery at Père Lachaise. This mausoleum, which reads La Mémoire Necropolitaine, features a large camera inside, with a reflective lens. La Mémoire Necropolitaine is a cultural association which aims to give a future to our past by safeguarding the funerary heritage through images. For more, scan this QR code to visit their website.